This morning we're concluding our series on misconceptions of the Bible. We're looking at several things that modern Christianity has taken from the Bible and used it in the wrong context or in the wrong way altogether. We call this series, The Bible Doesn't Say That. We're looking at things that people will take and use to fit their own agenda or sometimes even their own doctrine. <clears throat> On a website called Preparing for Eternity, there is an article that reads, Once saved, always saved. That is the cry so often heard from many Christians today. Below you will find a few quotes being preached by ministers who actually believed in once saved, always saved. Can you unfry an egg? Then after being saved, you cannot undo it. No personal breaking of God's or man's laws or commandments can nullify our salvation status. This is the one that really gets me. Once a person has been converted, all the sins he may commit, from idolatry to, mur to murder, will, now make his, will not make his soul in any more danger, even if he never repents of those sins. Many people believe those teachings today. But are they true? Is it true that once we've accepted Jesus as our personal Savior, is our salvation guaranteed and impossible to lose? Is there no risk whatsoever of ever losing it? Can we walk away from me, from God at any time and go back to living like the world in open rebellious sin and still be saved. Well today we're going to look at what the Bible actually says about this idea. That's what we've been doing throughout the series. We've looked at false teachings about money. False teachings about suffering. We've looked at the false teachings of how God helps those who help themselves. We've looked at how people have taken judge, judging and twisted it and turned it. We've looked at how the saying that God won't give us more than we can handle. But today we tackle this false teaching. The idea of once saved, always saved, it's a wonderful sounding idea. Just about everything that we've talked about in this series sounds wonderful. Sounds good. Sometimes it sounds even too good to be true. But it makes us think that no matter what we do, we're saved. It almost can be considered a license to sin, which is a very bad way of thinking. It's a very bad idea. It's a believing that Jesus died on the cross to save us so that we continue to can continue to live life the way we want to. This concept gives false hope to those that choose to accept Christ, but for one reason or another choose to return to living a life of sin. Today we're going to take a biblical look at this concept. And we're going to see that the Bible doesn't actually say that once you're saved, you're always saved. But nothing can separate us from God's love. In Romans chapter 8, verses 39, 38 through 39, we read, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now this is a scripture that's so often used to defend the idea of once saved, always saved. However, this scripture is talking about God's unconditional love. Paul tells us that nothing can separate us from God's love. But even though God's love is unconditional, salvation is conditional. Did you notice that sin is not included in those lists that Paul gave us? Now, sin cannot separate us from God's love. But sin can separate us from God's presence. 
If we continue to live in sin, we separate ourselves from God. When God sent Jesus to die on the cross, He did so because He loves every person that has ever or will ever walk the face of this earth. One of the most popular scriptures, even unsaved people can quote this scripture, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God's love is unconditional. He loves everybody in the entire world, even those that reject Christ. Folks, I tell the kids on Wednesday nights, and even those that reject Christ their entire lives want to have nothing to do with God. They're, matter of fact, the ones that want to keep God out of everything, God still loves them. But eternal life is conditional. In order to have eternal life, eternal life, we must believe in Christ. But that includes obeying Him as well. Yes, as a Christian, we're all going to sin from time to time. However, we're commanded in the Bible to confess our sins and repent, and when we do, we're forgiven. That's why that one statement bothers me so much, because it says even, they, they teach that even if you don't repent, you're still saved. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible tells us to repent. In other words, we have to be sincere in seeking forgiveness. We have to truly mean we're sorry for what we've done. Yet if we continue to repeat the same sin so much as that it becomes part of our life, will we truly repent? Probably not. We choose to separate ourselves from God. And I agree with Paul. Nothing, not death, life, angels, demons, past, present, future, any powers, any height, any depth. Anything, there's nothing in creation that can separate, separate us from God's unconditional love. But sin will separate us from God's presence. God still loves those that reject Him. God still loves those that rebel against Him. God still loves those who die in their sin. Yet even in His unconditional love, God is still a God of justice. When we reject Him, or even when we accept Him, but we choose to return to a life of sin, His love is not going to save us. Does that mean He can't? No, He can. But it doesn't. It's our choice to accept Christ as our Savior. And it's our choice to remain in obedience to Him. So can we fall from grace? If grace is God's riches at Christ's expense, and it is a free gift, can we lose that gift? Matthew chapter 13, we find where Jesus compared sowing seeds to hearing the gospel. And in this story, Jesus explains four different types of hearts that hear the gospel. Starting in chapter nine, uh, verse 19, he says, When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. That is a seed sown along the path. These are the people that have hard hearts. They don't want to give the gospel a chance to say to change their lives. They're so wrapped up in the world that Satan is able to quickly turn their attention away from the gospel and onto something else. These are the people that reject Christ. These are the people that want you to reject Christ. These are the people that try to drive the name of Jesus out of everything. But then continuing in verses 20 and 21, it says, The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is a man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. And this is where the story gets a little complicated. 
These people receive the gospel with joy. They make a decision to accept Christ as their Savior. And everything is great until trouble or persecution enter the picture. When they're challenged for, they, for their beliefs, when their lack of knowledge and their lack of commitment comes into question, they fall away. Does that mean, as those who teach once saved, always saved, that that person was never saved in the first place? To be honest, we don't know because we don't know their hearts, but God knows their hearts. If they were sincere in their belief, they were saved. Yet, they chose to walk away. See, it doesn't take us long in Jesus' teaching on salvation to find that we can still be saved and fall away. But the story gets more complicated as we go. Continuing in verse 22, it says, The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. These people accept the gospel, accept Christ as their Savior, and they start out with a passion for serving Him. These are the people that, when they come to church, what can I do? When they finish that, what can I do? What can I do? They want to keep going. But then life gets difficult. And they decide to stop serving. Maybe they're looking for something better in their lives and what they have, so they fall into the deceitfulness of wealth. Maybe they've heard that money, the more you send, the more God will give. They begin to focus on that, or they begin to focus on their career, and they put their service for Christ behind them. Again, those that believe once saved, always saved, will say that these people were never truly saved. But Jesus never said that they weren't saved. He said they believed, but they were unfruitful. These people may be faithful churchgoers, but they don't do anything to serve in the church or in the community. They do nothing in their lives to develop the fruit of the Spirit. They do nothing to produce any fruit for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean they're not saved. Finally, Jesus tells us who is guaranteed to have eternal life. In verse 23, he says, But the one who received the seed that fell on the good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. These are the people who accepted Christ as their Savior, and they put Christ first in everything that they do. When they face difficult times, they turn to Christ for help. When they face persecution, they rely on Christ to protect them and carry them through. When life gets tough, instead of worrying about it, they trust that God's in control and that His will is going to be done. Instead of chasing the riches of this world, these are the people that seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. These are the people that are working in the church. They're spreading the gospel everywhere they go. They're doing whatever they can to remain obedient to God's word. These people choose to walk with Jesus no matter what life throws at them. And the result, they produce 30, 60, to 100 times the fruit that was sown in their heart. Will these people still sin and fall short? Of course. Folks, we're not going to be made sinless until we're called home to heaven. But when we fail, we'll confess. We'll repent and we'll learn from those mistakes. From these scriptures, we can see that we can be saved and still fall from grace. Sometimes it can be the difficulties of life that drive us away. Sometimes it can be persecution or the deceitfulness of wealth. Sometimes it can be worry. Or it can even be sin that causes us to fall away from Jesus. So we need to remain faithful no matter what. If we can fall from grace, 
What do we need to do to keep that from happening? God will do his part of the promise. We need to uphold our end by remaining faithful no matter what we face in our lives. John chapter 15, verses 5 through 6, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. That right there tells us we can fall away. Jesus is the vine. We're the branches. We must remain faithful to him no matter what life throws at us. And when we do, we're going to bear fruit. We're going to bear fruit not just in our lives, but we're going to bear fruit in the lives of other people. See, that's the key to all this. We must remain faithful to Christ. Well, if we can choose to remain faithful, that means we can choose to remove ourselves from Him. We can choose to remove ourselves from grace. See, we're given this wonderful thing that a lot of people don't understand. We're given this wonderful thing called free will. And we can choose to follow Christ or reject Him. There's no scripture in the Bible where we are told that we will be forced to remain faithful that's left up to us. One day we'll either be rewarded or punished for our choice, but God is not going to force us to choose to remain faithful. Because if He did, He would remove the gift that He gave us of free will. Therefore, we can choose to walk away from Christ in return to living in the ways of this world. That doesn't mean that we weren't saved. If we do, Jesus said, we would be like the branches that are thrown away. We'll be left to wither and burn. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus again says, He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who overcomes is the one who remains faithful no matter what happens in his life. If we do, we're dressed in white. Christ will acknowledge us before God the Father and even the angels and will enter eternal life because our name is written in the book of life. However, if we don't overcome, if we fall from grace and we give in to the pressures of this world, we can be denied before God and the angels and our name can be blotted out. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 5 says, I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud, and that they all passed in the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. The Paul uses this and he reminds us they were not that much different than the people of Israel. They were baptized into Moses like we're baptized into Christ. They ate the spiritual food and drank the spiritual water just like we eat the bread and drink of the cup of the Lord's Supper. All of which come from the rock. Their rock is Jesus Christ. He was their rock, and he's our rock. But God was not pleased with most of them, and they died in the desert, never to enter their promised land. Over the next several verses, Paul lists how Israel rejected God. They created an idol. They committed sexual immorality. They tested God. They grumbled against God. And as a result, all but two, all but two of that generation died in the desert. Paul wanted to remind us that God's chosen people even rejected him. And even though he saved them time and time again, they never entered their promised land. The same goes for us. 
Even though we may have accepted Christ as our Savior, if we don't remain faithful, we will never enter our promised land. Continuing in verse 11 through 13, it says, These things happened to them as examples and was written down as warnings to us on whom the fulfillment of the ages had come. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you not, do not fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted... He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. God's word tells us that the Israelites tells us about the Israelites not so that we know the history. It's important that we know the history but also as an example and as a warning to us so that we don't find ourselves rebelling as they did. We need to watch out that we don't fall into temptation. We should never trust that we can stand up in the face of temptation by ourselves. Because if we do, we're going to fail. We cannot stand up to temptation without Christ. We don't face anything different, anything harder than the temptations that the Israelites faced. But we don't face it alone. If we try, like I said, we're going to fail. We're going to give in. But when we trust God to get us through, He is faithful and will help us to find a way out. Sometimes we don't look for a way out, but God has provided a way out. He can help us stand strong in the face of temptation. Again, we see that God keeps His end of the bargain. We need to keep on. We need to look for that way out instead of giving in. We need to rely on Christ to carry us through the difficulties and the temptations of life. And when we do, we're never going to fall from grace. The Bible doesn't say that once you're saved, you're always saved. The Bible says that we have a choice to make each and every day of our lives. Do we remain faithful? Or do we return to the ways of this world? If we choose to return to the world, we choose to walk away from Christ. We choose to walk away from our salvation. God won't remove our salvation from us, but we can remove it ourselves by not staying faithful. Nothing can remove us from God's love, but we can remove ourselves from His presence. Eternal life is only guaranteed to those that remain faithful in their walk with Christ. Those that confess their sin. Those that repent. We must rely on Christ to carry us through the difficult times in life and the temptations that we face. If we try without Him, we're going to fail. John Hines wrote that according to the Protestant doctrine, once saved, always saved, there's no reason to take heed. For a man cannot fall. He can stand even in sin. The Lord does not care. Is that not the logical conclusion of this doctrine? That's not what the Word of God teaches. Our sins can be washed away by God Himself. We can be delivered from sin, but we're not in heaven yet. That is why we must remain faithful unto death. Today and every day, we must decide to remain faithful to the one that gave his life on the cross for us. We're only once saved, always saved, when we remain faithful and keep our end of the covenant by allowing Christ to produce fruit in our lives and fruit in the lives of those around us. As we conclude this series, I hope that we've learned something. I know I have. So take this and think about the things that we've talked about throughout this series. And talk to other people about it. Maybe you can clear up a misconception in their life. There's so many more that we can do, but six weeks is long enough for a series sometimes. There's many other things that we can look at. This morning, we see that the Bible doesn't say that once we're saved, we're always saved. 